Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first edition of Brass 101 for the 2022 and 23 season. Uh, we're happy that you've taken the time to this evening to learn a little bit more about snow safety, and we have a great program for you coming up. We'll have Cindy Burlack joining us in just a minute, but before we do, I wanna run through a few points. Uh, this evening's presentation will be conducted by Dale Atkins. We'll be introducing him in a few minutes. After the presentation around the top of the hour, uh, we'll have a Q&A with Dale, and then we'll be wrapping it up and we will be bringing in US ski team downhill racer, Jared Goldberg, who will be with us this evening uh, to uh, talk a little bit about the season coming up shortly and uh, last year's uh, uh, World Cup season. Uh, we also will be concluding this evening as we always do with a showing of off piste. Again, we appreciate you joining us here this evening. I want to send a shout out to uh, some of our brass sponsors, World Cup Supply, U.S. Ski and Snowboard, Backcountry Access, Know Before You Go, great program uh, produced by the Utah Avalanche Center and Nordica. Thanks to all of our partners for joining us, along with all of the partners of the Know Before You Go program who have made this program possible this evening. Uh, we're waiting for Cindy to join us, and when she does, we'll cut into her. But I want to just say a few words about Bryce and Ronnie. As many of you know, Bryce and Ronnie were two aspiring U.S. ski team stars uh, who unfortunately uh, lost their lives in an avalanche in 2015. Out of that came the formation of the Brass Avalanche Safety Foundation. And to tell us a little bit more and to introduce tonight's program, please welcome Cindy Burlack. Cindy? Hi, thanks so much, Tom, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking your time to learn about avalanche danger. We could not bring this program to you without our dedicated sponsors, Utah Avalanche Center, Know Before You Go, Nordica, Backcountry Access, World Cup Supply, and U.S. Ski and Snowboard. Uh, we wish our son, Ronnie, and Bryce Astle of Snowboard had been provided the information that you will hear. They were like each of you. The more time on skis, the better. It was where they felt most at home. They're still making an impression, drawing in ski racers and recreationalists. Uh, they are motivating us at Brass, which is the Bryce Ronnie Athlete Snow Safety. We're so proud of their accomplishments in ski racing, their legacies of being good young men who worked hard and took their goals seriously. For US ski team athletes as they were, or any other kind of athlete, it takes only one day of not knowing the snow dangers or poor decision-making on the part of coaches or themselves to bring all dreams and aspirations to a tragic end. The pain of losing our boys still hangs over the ski racing community almost after after almost eight years. So speaking from experience, it's not fun to lose somebody close to you. So don't put your family and friends in that position. If you like powder, listen carefully and take more classes. This information could make the difference between your coming home from a great day of skiing or not. I'd like to introduce our wonderful uh, presenter tonight, who is Dale Atkins, a member of our board. He started out and, as a ski patroller and then went to mountain rescue. His experience led him to be an avalanche forecaster and researcher for Colorado Avalanche Information Center. He spent a decade working for RECO, which is the Swedish company, which makes small reflecting devices, which can be sewn into outer gear and detect a person under dense snow. Dale served as the past president of American Avalanche Association. And today he's a leader in the training of mountain rescuers around the world. In short, he's packed in a lifetime of selflessly spreading snow safety. Here he is, Dale Atkins. Thank you, Cindy. 
I and, and welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out to this evening's program. Uh, we're going to get going here, and I hate to start with an apology, but we're going to do a kind of a team effort this evening. I don't have a great internet connection, so I'm going to be uh, Tom Kelly's going to be my right hand man running the controls from his place while I'm holed up in another hotel. But here we go. And I don't know how many of you are ski racers. Um, I hope some of you are. Some of you may just be backcountry types. But the whole idea here is that education is important because whether it's going into the backcountry, back it's going out of the area or off piece, it's a place you can get in trouble with avalanches. And we can go to the next one, Tom. Yeah, Cindy mentioned that uh, mentioned about getting education. And tonight, for some of you, this may be review. For some of you, this may be new. But this is avalanche awareness. It's an introduction to snow and avalanches. And you'll learn some helpful tips in this. But I think what all of us at Brass hope is that this is a journey that you're starting off, or maybe you're well on the way. But learning about snow and avalanches is a journey, so we'll start with it tonight. So what's an avalanche? Well, they come in all shapes and sizes, but there's two that we're primarily concerned about, and the most important is the slab avalanche, where a cohesive unit of snow fails at once and slides down the mountainside, like what we see in the left-hand picture. It's literally like pulling the carpet out from underneath you. And I'll talk about the second type a little bit later, but tonight we're gonna to really focus on slab avalanche problems. And it doesn't have to be big avalanches to ruin one's day. And if we look at North America and Europe, about 140, 150 people are killed uh, each winter. Worldwide, the number is actually about 300 to 500 people. There's a difference though. Almost all of these fatalities in North America and Europe are recreationalists, skiers, snowmobilers, climbers. In the rest of the world, they are people that are just, they're the villagers, people on roads, maybe some climbers. So since we go out, we trigger avalanches, we can know before we go and stay out of trouble. And in this program, we're gonna hit on these four key topics getting the forecast, the gear, getting the training, and getting the picture. And you put all four of these together, and it should be enough to keep us out of harm's way. So getting the forecast. So let's look at, you know, where do you go to get this? And, and how do we use a, a forecast? Next one, Tom, please. Whether you're walking your dog, skiing, snowboarding, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, if you're heading out into mountains that have snow, you need to get an avalanche forecast. The cool thing about forecasting is you're taking all of these different data points and all this really complex information and you're synthesizing it into something simple. Uh, Nikki, 80 is minus 2, oh 90 God. minus 3, so nice temperature gradient there between those two layers. We're looking at observations from the public, from professional users, observations that we personally get in the field. And what we mean by those observations is snow pit results, uh, new snow instabilities, wind, weather, uh, anything that's actually going on in the backcountry, recent avalanches. Uh, this is two to four millimeter it's near surface facets. Now we're putting that all in together and we're trying to get one simplified bottom line statement for what's going on. Avalanche forecasts can really come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. 
different centers might use a little different format. But the bottom line, all of us are focusing about on the same information across the globe. No matter where you are in the world, Avalanche information is right at your fingertips. And that's gonna be weather information, snowpack information, information about recent avalanches, and what the overall avalanche danger is in a mountain range. When you first check the forecast, one of the first things you're gonna see is that bottom line statement. In that, we're gonna discuss the avalanche danger scale. The avalanche danger scale consists of five ascending levels from low to extreme. Your chance of encountering an avalanche increases dramatically with each level. So we've got this scale that discusses size and distribution, the likelihood, and then overall travel advice for the day. Beyond just the bottom line statement, we're gonna see avalanche problems. It's just really important to recognize that there's different types of avalanches. The avalanche forecast is gonna give you that information, which ultimately you can use to make better choices in the mountains. An avalanche forecast isn't just done by one person. It's a huge team effort, not only by the forecast staff, but also by our local communities. What I find so special about the mountains is really the freedom and the friendships that you create out there. And it's my hope that other people can go into the mountains and experience this same joy that I do, and ultimately, at the end of the day, come home safe. Yeah, that's the, that's the goal. It's to go out and have fun, but the main goal is to come back at the end of the day. So what are some of the things that are included in the avalanche forecast? Well, we heard about it in the video, but before I address that, here's just where you can go to get, these are the portals to avalanche information, avalanche.org in the States, avalanche.ca to the North in Canada, and in Europe, avalanches.org. And all of these programs have pretty standardized uh, forecasts. And here's what the map would look like with avalanche.org. Yeah, there's plenty of colors and they signify differences and dangers, but please always go past the color. Always go past the descriptor. Take the time to read the forecast. As we saw in the, in the video, the avalanche danger rating is a composite of advice and likelihood in the size and distribution. But avalanche danger, I want to point out, you'll see considerable is right in the middle. And usually we don't think of considerable or things in the middle as being very dangerous. We think of them as kind of average. But considerable, and if you look to the likelihood of avalanches, it says natural avalanches are possible human triggered avalanches are likely. That's really scary. Considerable danger is scary because human triggered avalanches are likely. And we see most of our avalanche fatalities happen when the danger is moderate and considerable because there's a lot of uncertainty we have to deal with. We can go to the next one, Tom. So avalanches can be big or small, but the important thing is even the smallest avalanches are really big to us. So small avalanches are just as deadly as the big avalanches. So the forecast is gonna give you a lot of information. It gives you the baseline, not just the danger and the likelihood of avalanches, but it tells you where that are happening, uh, what weak layers are out there, the sizes to expect. And the avalanche forecast is, is really, uh, they come with often weather forecasts as well. So you're getting great information about conditions and avalanche dangers in the undeveloped or the backcountry areas. So we get the forecast, now we've got to get the gear. So what's essential, what's important, and how, how does it all work? And let's take a look at this. So yeah, you tried to do everything right, but you've got a plan for the worst case, and that is getting in an avalanche. So now what? 
shift, but I feel like there is so many new users to the backcountry. It scares me. It scares me that everyone thinks I just buy this expensive gear and I can get on the chairlift and I'll be fine. Get the gear, but get the education, understand how to use it, and have solid backcountry partners. I'm worried about storm slabs in Alpine and Tree Line uh, on all slopes. So the avalanche observed yesterday on the parkway. The reality is, backcountry is getting busier and busier. There's just more and more people out there. So with that comes a higher level of risk. We've all heard a lot of stories about people who didn't even have a beacon on or no shovel, no probe. And that would have been the thing that would have saved them. Gotcha. It is a really pretty helpless situation to be in if you don't have the right tools. There's really no outside help. You know, it's really up to their partners to get to them as quickly as possible and know how to use a transceiver, a probe, and a shovel, use it well, and dig them out of the snow. In a full burial, your heart's beating and you don't know how long you're going to be riding it out for and how much oxygen you're eventually going to have. Time is of the essence. I would want to know when I'm going to the backcountry that I have solid partner and they're super familiar with using that equipment. We're right here. We got you. If you've been in an avalanche and someone's buried, that's where having the gear and knowing how to use it can make all the difference in the outcome. Yeah, so the key pieces of gear, the avalanche transceiver. The avalanche transceiver is this small radio-like device that sends out a signal that your friends, your partners can receive, and they can start following that signal in. And then with the, the transceiver, we use the probe pole. So once we're real close, we wanna pinpoint the spot, we use the probe pole. It's kind of like a, a tent pole, um, but it's, it is an important piece of gear. And then we need the shovel and Shoveling through avalanche debris is difficult. It takes a lot of work. In fact, to dig somebody out, you're going to have to move about 2,000 pounds of snow. A ton of snow is what's covering your friend. Probably thinking you wish you had a bigger shovel, but it's a lot of work to get somebody out. But the transceiver, probe, and shovel, those are the core pieces of equipment that we all need to have when we're going out into avalanche terrain. Another important piece of gear is the avalanche airbag. And the avalanche airbag, well, it, it follows something called the Brazil nut theory, where the biggest nuts rise to the top. You're at a party, you see the bowl of mixed nuts. You saunter over, you want a big Brazil nut or macadamia nut, you don't see one. Well, what do you do? There's two approaches. The uncouth just stick their hands in and root around. But the more suave, sophisticated types, what do we do? Yeah, we pick the bowl up and we shake it. The large nuts rise to the top. Same thing happens in an avalanche. The airbag makes us one of the larger particles so that we are forced up to the top. We don't float, we are actually forced up as the small particles of snow settle in beneath us. So airbags are really effective, but they don't necessarily mean they're going to save your life. There's some other pieces of gear. I don't have shown here, but it's the reco reflector. Reco reflectors are important. They're not a companion or a partner rescue tool. They're a tool that makes you searchable 
to the professionals, to the ski patrols and mountain rescuers. So reco in your gear is really a good idea. If you've had an accident, you're gonna be there for a while. In fact, however long it took you to get to where you are, it's gonna take rescuers at least that long and probably longer. So you need to have gear to be able to stay and wait. And plus just, you should be carrying the 10 essential sort of stuff so that you can travel comfortably and with less risk in the back country. So you should have a pack with the first aid kit. Boy, avalanches kill. And it's not good when you get caught in an avalanche, but it gets bad when you get buried. In fact, it gets really bad. The statistics tell us that about three out of four avalanche victims die of asphyxia or suffocation. There's some good news there. That means if we're really fast, we've got a chance at saving their life. About a quarter of avalanche victims die from trauma. But if asphyxia is the problem, it means time is the enemy. The clock is, tipping, is ticking. And we really have a 10, 15 minute window to get to somebody. But when we look at this, what we see at the tail end of the graph is that it doesn't really go to zero because there are a few very lucky people that survive for many hours under the snow. And as a rescuer, I like to hope, we like to hope and give the benefit of doubt to every buried victim that they might be that next lucky person. Yeah, gear can find your body. In fact, all the gear, it's, it's really, it finds people. Partners, they're your best chance to save your life. However, what doesn't get told in avalanche programs is that, yes, this, is, this gets told, your best chances of being found alive are in the hands of your friends. So pick your friends carefully that you ski with. However, what doesn't get told is that friends only find their buried friends alive about half of the time. So getting buried in an avalanche, you only have about a 50-50 chance of survival. And that's not good. So the training, it's so important. And by getting, taking avalanche courses, not just a course, but courses, you're gonna learn a lot. And it's this journey. And I welcome everybody to start exploring it and learning. So let's look at training. I was so keen at that point in time and, and, you, and really didn't know what was safe and not. That hour was definitely a bit eye-opening to how quickly things can go wrong in the backcountry. I got lucky, but unfortunately, a lot of people do not. With a little bit of avalanche training, a lot of accidents can be avoided. Looking at the bulletin, it's been warm yesterday and then uh, cooled down quite a bit overnight. Probably the main concern today um, would be the wet and loose uh, on the sunny aspect. If anybody has the motivation to go out into the backcountry, whether that's skiing, sledding, riding, I would say an entry level avalanche course is totally critical. That'd be perfect. Your general entry level avalanche course will have fundamental knowledge about avalanches, how snow and layers and snowpack work. Uh, we're just looking for a good site for a profile. Let's dig. Typically, you do a little bit of avalanche rescue practice, so you get your transceivers out, probe, shovel. And the beacon just comes down to the knee, and you just move forward. Practice with that gear so that you know what to do if something were to go wrong. That's it. A little bit about trip planning, reading the avalanche hazard bulletins, and then sort of picking a suitable trip. Uh, you'll do a little bit about traveling through avalanche train. The number one problem of the day was the wet loose avalanches, which is what's raising the avalanche hazard for the day. We've got a little one starting. That's a good indicator of where things are going. Well, the 
mountains and the snowpack can feel quite complex at times. The sort of entry level avalanche courses give you some fundamental knowledge that allows you to maybe make sense of some of the things that you're observing out in the mountains. And that fundamental knowledge can, can be useful to avoid avalanche accidents. I personally couldn't imagine a life without skiing and climbing in, in the mountains. It just gives you so much vitality in your life, which is awesome. With anything, uh, to be a master of your craft takes a lot of practice and a lot of time, and it's an ongoing, sort of lifelong learning process. I've been working with avalanches for 15 years now, and I'm still learning every day. Yeah, we're still learning every day. And that's even for an old salt like, like me. So what are some of the things we're going to learn in a course? Well, a lot of it's about terrain. Let's go to the next one, Tom. So a key thing with avalanche courses, yeah, there's some classroom time, but it's about getting out in the field with ins experienced instructors that can show you the terrain, they can show you the snowpack. And it's all about an interaction between terrain, weather, snowpack, and people. And we'll hear more about the human factor a little bit later this evening. So as we look at this, this mountainside in, in training, and you can start the uh, click on it, Tom. I think everyone sees the avalanche in it. And this is the slab avalanche, that classic or that unit of snow is released at once and slid down the mountainside. And then if we click onto the next one, we're gonna look at a loose snow avalanche. These start as a single point and spread out kind of like an inverted, inverted V or fan. And slab avalanches are what get us in trouble. Loose snow avalanches though are often a problem for climbers. When you look at this scene, there's a lot of things to see through your avalanche eyeballs. There's probably two dozen different things. And in an avalanche class, you're gonna be looking at terrain like this and being able to start recognizing these clues uh, to avalanche danger. And with those clues, it's also with time, you'll start to learn how to interpret them and what they mean so that you can project and forecast into the future, but it takes time. So get the, get the training. And if you check with your local avalanche center in here in Utah or Colorado, Washington, wherever you are, New Hampshire, uh, avalanche centers all around the country and avalanche.org can get you there. There's also the know before you go. Uh, and then certainly through brass, we're doing avalanche education. So getting the picture, can you describe avalanche terrain? Can you, do you know how to travel through it? Do you know what the warning signs are? That, those are some of the other things you'll learn in the avalanche course. Avalanche terrain is simply terrain steep enough to shred. Reality is that the fun places in the backcountry are the places where avalanches are possible. It only takes one bad mistake to. Uh... Avalanche, avalanche. Killed in an avalanche. To lead to a lot of pain for a lot of people. In order to safely travel in the backcountry, you need to understand the bigger picture. Firstly, you need to recognize avalanche terrain and how to safely travel through it. Secondly, you need to constantly observe the ever-changing conditions. Welcome to the final chapter. 
It's really important to understand that the second you step in the back country, you're going into terrain that hasn't received any active avalanche mitigation. It's important that you can recognize avalanche terrain. By definition, avalanche terrain is any slope steeper than 30 degrees. No one can be a perfect avalanche forecaster. Snow science is an inexact science. When you look at the forecast in the morning and make that assessment, you have to be prepared for the fact that the conditions could actually change during the day. The one constant is terrain. And what we can do is position ourselves with best terrain practices through it. So you think about moving to the mountains, there is safe zone to safe zone. And it's those best terrain practices that set us up for success. We're all going out as a group for the A objective, but along the way, we may have some sort of weather characteristic that changes that decision. It's really helpful to just have some big red flags that are telling you it's time to reevaluate. And those things are rapid snowfall, rapid wind, shooting cracks, wumpfing, recent avalanches, or rapid warm-up. We've just moved to the trees, and at this point, wherever we go is avalanche terrain. In order to minimize our exposure as a group, we're gonna go from safe zone to safe zone, moving one at a time through this terrain. Having guidelines are very effective ways to give yourself a framework where you're less inclined to make emotional decisions that could be bad ones. Just like on the way up, we're gonna expose one person at a time on this slope. I'm about to drop in. Do you guys have eyes on? Yep. Awesome, let's do that. Dropping in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. The skill set to safely travel in the backcountry is something that's achievable by anybody. It's important that you dedicate yourself to understanding the basics. So you've got the gear, you've got the training, you've got the forecast, you've got the picture. Let's go get the goods. Yeah, getting the goods. And the problem is those goods are often on those steeper slopes. And trying, in fact, most avalanches occur on slopes that are 30 to 45 degrees in steepness. And trying to tell skiers and riders and snowmobilers to stay off of those slopes is kind of like telling a golfer to stay off of flat drain. It's just not gonna happen. And I think as you look at these two pictures, you can see obviously the one on the left is a big avalanche and it's certainly more than 30 degrees. And the one on the right, yeah, that's pretty flat, mellow terrain. But take a closer look at this one on the left, the, the big avalanche, and notice all the tracks that are around it. And some of those tracks were put in before it avalanched. So we're dealing with uncertainty, but it, comes down to the terrain, because terrain is where we can pick to go or we can pick to avoid. And that certainly looks like fun. I mean, uh, snowmobiles, that's probably the best way to get guaranteed face shots. And why does this matter? It matters a lot because it's going to determine if you come home or not. We can go to the next one, Tom. So this idea of getting the picture and you know, what if you were here or there? So when you travel in avalanche terrain, you should always be asking yourself, well, am I in avalanche terrain or am I exposed to avalanches? But always ask yourself, if an avalanche were to happen, 
what's going to happen to me? And if you don't like your answer, you need to move. Boy, I think all of you uh, see a number of things that are wrong here. First, it kind of looks like a circus out there in both of those. But in the video, you heard several of the people say, travel one at a time, only go one at a time. In fact, the golden rule of traveling in avalanche terrain is to expose only one person to the hazard at a time. And boy, with skins, it's easy to skin up and zigzag up avalanche prone slopes. So always be thinking about what's going on. And with snowmobiles, it's really easy to go up and down slopes and even with all your friends. But be deliberate and be conscientious and only go one at a time when you're crossing avalanche slopes, going up them, down them, or across them. This is a great video and you can see the slab avalanche. It says triggered by an explosive. But boy, it just, they accelerate so fast and avalanches, even small ones will travel 40, 50, 70 miles an hour. Big avalanches will travel well over a hundred miles an hour. But let's get back to inside the ski area. So inside the ski area, the ski patrols work really hard to manage the terrain. Tom, if we could go back one, please. They work really hard to manage that terrain and they do a phenomenal job because dealing with snow is all about uncertainty. Inside the ski areas, you can have little, very little avalanche risk, except maybe during the biggest storms. And you've probably been out and, and heard the explosions that go off. And I'll just point out, because you can see the artillery piece, the, uh, the howitzers that are, are fired, those weapons are actually going away. And in the next probably 10 years, we're going to see much more sophisticated use of explosives in our ski areas. So things are changing. But inbounds, it's a great place to be when the snow is scary. Outside of the area and out of area, it's not just out of bounds, it's out of the area because you're leaving the ski area. And you notice they're going through gates here at Jackson and that's the case of just about all our ski areas around the country. Because you're going from a very managed and really a quite safe environment to the wild west when you leave a ski area. And that wild west, that distance between managed and unmanaged is actually only about a quarter inch. It's the strand of a piece of rope. So when you're going out of area and there's great terrain, but it's really, you're going into the back country. So you need to be prepared. If you ski in Europe, or if, certainly if you wanna go to Europe, you know, you'll see signs like this warning you of avalanche danger. And in fact, the yellow and black checkerboard sign is the European standard for uh, alerting to avalanche danger. In fact, up to a few years ago, ski areas would even fly a flag, a checkered yellow and black flag, when there was significant avalanche danger. But be alert to these signs. And even inside our ski areas, when ropes are up for a reason, closed areas are there not to hoard the powder, but they're there to protect you, the skiers and riders. So please follow the rules. So when do you reevaluate your plans? The reality is you're reevaluating all the time when you're out there. And anytime you make a change in aspect, significant change in elevation, snow conditions change, weather conditions change, but one of our best clues in time to really reevaluate is when you've got an avalanche. Let's go to the next one, please, Tom. So let's look at some red flags. There's, I think we've got five of them in, in this list. But a recent avalanche is your best clue to avalanche danger. It's, it's literally nature's yelling at you uh, that things are dangerous. And the beauty about a recent avalanche is you know where the danger is 
aspect, elevation, slope angle. You may even know about the weak layer and about this slab. All the answers are there. And when an avalanche hasn't happened, there's often more uncertainty than there are with the answers. So recent avalanches, most important. We talk about this as maybe talking snow or tracking collapsing snow. It's shooting tracks that shoot out from underfoot. It's collapsing. And maybe you felt yourself drop just a few inches or even a lot and heard a whoop sound or hollow drum-like sound. Cracking and collapsing, these are also nature's way of really yelling at you that the situation's really dangerous. The snow has failed, it's fractured, it hasn't slid because it couldn't overcome friction. Why? Probably because the slope's not steep enough. Let's look at another red flag. Blowing snow, that wind drifted snow, and that those, oh, those banners of, uh, of snow, they're blowing off the mountain. Those are telling you where the snow is loading and what slopes are becoming dangerous. As snow is stripped off the windward side and blown over and drifts onto the leeward slopes. So by knowing wind direction and the patterns by the wind, we can avoid those slopes. One thing about wind, snow is, snow is the building blocks of, of an avalanche, but wind is its architect. Wind can redistribute snow into starting zones at rates much greater than will ever fall out of the sky. And speaking of out of the sky, you know, heavy snowfall, yeah, certainly a lot of snow, that, is a, that increases the avalanche danger. And so does rain, but rain does not have to be heavy. Just even light rain on fresh snow can destabilize it. Rain changes the mechanical qualities of, of snow very, very quickly. And rapidly rising temperatures. Snow is a really unique material because it exists so close to its melting point. So little changes in temperature can actually have big impact on the snow, on the structure and how it changes and ultimately in the avalanche danger. Nature doesn't, I should say, nature often makes things happen quickly. Snow does not like rapid change. So rapidly rising temperatures can, worsen the avalanche danger very quickly. Usually we think of this in springtime when thaw conditions arise, but it can also happen on midwinter on those southerly exposed slopes that are getting a lot of sunshine you know, in February and early March. So before you go, it's all about getting that forecast, getting the gear, getting the training and getting the picture. And I wanna just make a comment or two here and then we'll, we'll move on to some human factor stuff, is about the gear. Get the gear, learn how to use it, know how to use it, but travel as if you left it at home. Because once you're buried, as I mentioned earlier, your chances of survival are not good. So we've gotta know how to use it, but we've gotta make smart decisions and travel as if we left it at home to stay out of trouble. And now I'm gonna turn it over to a video here and you can start the video, Tom, with just shape. She'll talk a little bit about the human factors. One of the most important factors in snow safety is decision-making. Hi, I'm Jess Shade. I'm a mental health therapist and a high-altitude ski mountaineer, and I'm thrilled to join Brass Avalanche in providing insight into how you can be safe in the backcountry. What do all fatal avalanches have in common? Snow, of course, and people. We are the common denominator. Today we are going to cover the following topics awareness, decision-making and risk, group dynamics, and goal-driven choices. How aware are you right now? What are your surroundings? Who is with you? What did you do right before logging on? 
As humans, our brains value efficiency. We can't pause to think about every single movement, from brushing our teeth to walking the dog. We often find ourselves on autopilot. However, sometimes exiting autopilot really matters. When you are considering exiting resort boundaries, skiing off-piste in restricted areas, how aware are you? Are you slowing down long enough to ask, do I have the training? Do I have avalanche gear? Who am I with? What's the danger rating? And what are the avalanche problems today? Awareness is the first step to both safety and fun. So in terms of self-knowledge, how do you make decisions? Do you trust your gut? Do you assess every potentiality? Do you ask someone else and follow their advice? Is it a mix of these? Thinking about this from the perspective of an athlete, how do you train and prepare? Do you have a plan for a race or for an event? How intentional are you? Also under self-knowledge, how do you view risk? How do you know if the risk is worth the reward? To aid in evaluating risk, here's a straightforward tool called the risk equation. So your risk score equals the likelihood of the risk occurring multiplied by the severity should the risk occur multiplied by the time of exposure to the risk. If you can't answer the risk equation, you're gambling. Is it worth it? Often we do not find ourselves making decisions and evaluating risk alone. We're in a group, which can complicate things. So here are some questions to ask yourself before stepping out into off-piste or backcountry terrain. Who are you with? Just a simple list of the people can cue our awareness. How well do you know them? How do they make decisions and view risk? What is their knowledge? Are they trustworthy in avalanche terrain? Are you trying to impress them? Could you tell them no if you wanted to? Would you follow them no matter what? When we seed our ability to make decisions about risk, we outsource our safety. Goals are important to all of us, especially in athletic endeavors like skiing and snowboarding. Goals are one of the best ways to direct intentional decision making. So what is your goal? Why are you out there? Is your goal the stoke train, peer pressure, impressing a teammate, or is it different? Often we are motivated by things that aren't actually our goals. For example, social factors often influence our decisions, even if the decision works against a goal. I'll stay up late to hang out, but be exhausted for training, school, the new job I'm psyched about. Or, I'll exit the resort boundary because everyone else wants to, but I'd like to scout the course one more time to prepare for my race. Does this risk relate to my goal? And at what cost? Bryce Astle and Ronnie Burlack were skiers, just like you and I. They were great skiers. On that day in 2015, they made decisions, as did their teammates and their coaches. There were many decisions made that day that could have changed the outcome. Exiting the gates, skiing off-piste, or closed terrain is stepping into risk. Are you aware of yourself and your partners? What goal do you have? How does skiing backcountry, out of area, or off-piste terrain relate to your goal? On behalf of Brass Avalanche, thank you for your attention. Be safe out there this winter. Well, that was great from Jess. I just want to make a couple of comments to uh, wrap this up and then I'll turn it back uh, formally over to Tom. Let's go back to the avalanche danger ratings, that, that scale. I mentioned, don't just look at the numbers, don't just look at the color because the danger, the actual, the real danger actually doubles each time you make one increase, you increase the level once. 
And I didn't say that very well, but here we go, I'll try it again. With each one step increase in the avalanche danger rating, you actually double the avalanche danger potential. So moderate danger is twice the risk of low danger. Considerable danger is four times that risk. So the danger goes up real quickly. And with that, I think I can turn it back to you, Tom, and we'll see if there's any uh, questions or comments. Okay, thank you very much, Dale. We will now go to a Q and A. If you have any questions, uh, you can put them into the chat dialog box or the Q and A. Uh, happy to answer any questions. We'll be going to our U.S. Ski Team athlete for the evening, Jared Goldberg, in just a minute. But uh, Dale is happy to answer any questions that you might have about the presentation or maybe something else that wasn't included. I think while we're waiting for some more questions to come into the box, uh, you did cover this, but I think it's something that's very important to us and close to us at Brass. If you could talk a little bit about the off-piste, uh, out-of-area, uh, that's what uh, was such an issue with Bryce and Ronnie and the team in 2015, but maybe reiterate that again while we're waiting for a few questions. Sure, Tom, and that's really a, a, that's an important uh, distinction between in-area out of area, in area, off piste, on piste. European resorts are managed differently than our resorts here in North America. Here in North America, inside the ski area, the ski area of the patrol is responsible and they manage all of that terrain. So if you're skiing in the trees between groomed runs, in North America, in the US, that terrain is, that snow is managed. However, in Europe, there's peace and off peace. And peace are just simply the marked runs. They're basically the groomed runs, but they're marked with poles that go down the center. And off to the sides of them are off peace. And for the most part, that off peace terrain is not managed. It's not, avalanche mitigation efforts are not taken on it. So in Europe, if you venture into some untracked snow or some lightly tracked snow between two groomed runs or, or piste runs, you are venturing off piste. And that's a danger for avalanches. And it also changes the dynamics of getting rescue as well. Thank you very much, Dale. We've got a question from Brock Anderson, a good one. Uh, do you have any metrics on the average age or, or gender of avalanche victims? Is this something that you can attribute to different age levels or different genders more than the others? Avalanches are equal opportunity killers. Uh, there, there really isn't, Brock. Uh, we do know that the average age of avalanche victims in the United States has been increasing. It's now almost in the mid thirties, but I think our population is also increasing. Uh, gender, some people will say, make sure you ski, go out and ski with the ladies because they're smarter. Well, my wife is certainly smarter, but she still likes taking risk too. Um, the reality is, is there's probably fewer ladies out there on the steeper terrain. Um, so I, I'd be careful of, making those gender distinctions. Uh, it's really more of a numbers thing. Hey, we're open for questions. You can put them into the Q&A or the chat dialogue boxes while we're waiting for another one. Here's something that I've pondered a lot. Uh, do, you, do you or do you recommend wearing a transceiver when you're skiing in area? Not planning on going out of area, but you're skiing in area. Would you consider wearing a transceiver? On some days, yes, absolutely. And those days are early season when terrain is just getting opened up and it's had very few skiers on it. That's when we tend to have problems inside our ski areas. It's just hard to manage that terrain. But also during those really big storm cycles, we get that week long snow that we, you know, we're, we love to, to be in. Those are days to have an avalanche transceiver around your neck 
have Reco reflectors in your gear as well. Good. Well, we're, uh, any more questions? We'll give folks another minute or so. Uh, Dale, we really appreciate the uh, knowledge and experience that you've brought here to our opening Brass 101 and want to thank you for all of the work that you've put into this and helping get ready for our launch this evening. Uh, so thank you very much, Dale. We appreciate you being here. We do have one more question. This one from Carol Arvidson. Uh, uh, we have covered this already, she says, but can you restate the best sites in each region or in the U.S. to get avalanche conditions? Sure, it's real easy to get avalanche conditions, the avalanche forecast bulletins anywhere in the US, go to avalanche.org, avalanche.org. And that's the portal for all avalanche information in the United States, both the forecast bulletins and also avalanche education as well. Well, Dale, thank you very much, and thanks to everyone. We're going to go now to uh, our U.S. Ski Team featured athlete. Dale, thank you very much. So we're going to go now to our featured athlete for this evening. Give us one second to bring him on the screen. Jared Goldberg, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Where are you in the yeah. world today? Uh, I'm, in, I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, awesome. for a couple more days. They're heading to Copper soon to train, start training. Hey. And is it snowing down in Salt Lake? Yeah, it's dumping. Uh, snowed all day yesterday. It was 63 degrees. Played nine holes of golf last night. And what do you know, woke up to an inch or two of snow. So <laughs> things change quickly. <laughs> it is crazy. I have to say, yeah. uh, up here in Park City, we're a little bit higher in elevation, although we're not as high as the Cottonwoods where you grew up skiing. But we've had well over a foot in town today up in Park City. Just doesn't feel like November 2nd, but we're going to take it, right? Yeah. No, I was up uh, up at Snowbird the other day and people were powder skiing already and on like rocks and grass. And I was I was tempted, but uh, way too early in the season. Got to let, got to let the base build up for a while. So no, that's for sure. Well, listen yeah. to, uh, appreciate you taking the time tonight, just to kick it off for those who might not know you, you've been on the U S ski team for a decade or so, but give us a little background on how you got started in ski racing. Yeah. So I, I actually learned to ski in Vermont in, uh, Killington. My parents were both ski instructors there and that's how they met. And uh, my parents are really big skiers and they had an opportunity to move out to Salt Lake City. And so I moved out here when I was about four years old and uh, started, I was mostly a snowboarder for a few years when I was younger. Um, when I was probably nine or nine or 10, I almost only snowboarded all year, but it actually taught me how to carve really well. So once I got back on, on skis, uh, I was just so much more comfortable at laying it over and going deep. Uh, so I think that that was actually really helpful for me to get better at, at carving. Um, so then I came up through the snowbird ski team um, and uh, made it onto the, the D team uh, for the U.S. team. And uh, but, you know, something, you know, this, you know, what um, you guys have been talking about, like this is something that I'm so glad to see that this is a thing now, because when I was coming up, we were obviously skiing as hard as we could wherever we went and powder skiing and we rarely were when I was you know much younger it was people weren't talking about wearing beacons and bounds and and being extra careful so um well, as I've got as I've gotten older when I my late teens and and definitely once I was starting to travel around the world more I became much more careful um like I just wanted to add you know after like the last conversation quick is that like if it, if I'm going up to the powder ski and I'm in bounds, I'm wearing a beacon every single time. And if it's because if it's three, four, five inches, um, I think it's worth having it on. It's the easiest thing in the world to put on. Um, so I think like taking little steps like, like that, like, why wouldn't you wear something like that? Um, when it's that easy and if it could save your life, um, uh, also to reiterate about skiing around Europe, it is, a, it is completely the wild west over there and uh i've when i was younger that we didn't talk about what was on piece what was off piece very much and i kind of just went off of my instincts of growing up at snowbird and and being around avalanche terrain a lot and doing some backcountry skiing and and it's scary over there and i would just say to everybody out there that you should err on the caution side always um we have incredible skiing in the u.s and we have 
really good patrollers and, and they, they take a lot of time to get everything safe in bounds and over there, they just don't have that. So um, sometimes I think you should have a good time when you're over traveling overseas, but I think it's sometimes it's not worth it and you should err on the side of caution, but um, just want to add that in. <laughs> Well, Jared, I really appreciate that. And I know that you're you're four years older than Bryce Astle, but he did grow up in the same club program. Did you know him at Snowbird? Yes. Yeah, we, we knew each other pretty well. We were um we raced in different eras for sure. But uh, you know, Bryce was a really good kid and um yeah, I really liked him. He's a really, really nice guy. And uh uh he you know, when I'd go and train at Snowbird, which I get the chance to do during the winter when I have breaks uh in the world cup schedule um I would train and get to get to ski song with him or whatever it was and and uh it was always cool because I'd be you know running world cup downhills and then come back and work on my slalom a little bit for the combines and he'd be there uh chasing me and and throwing down some good times and getting all excited you know so um yeah he was a good really good skier and uh um yeah, really good kid. Good. Well, Jed, I really appreciate your comments on that. And I know that since the accident in 2015, there has been a heightened level of awareness on the U.S. ski team. And we really appreciate you carrying that message. Let's go back and talk a little bit about your career. Uh, uh, Two-time Olympian, you've been to a number of world championships. Uh, I want to go back to last year. And I know there was disappointment in not making the Olympic team, but you did end up coming back at the end of the season, defending your title in the downhill. Give us a little rundown on last year and uh, uh, how that's going to be a springboard for you as you head into the next season. Totally. Uh, yeah, last year was uh, pretty much ski racing in a nutshell. Um, started out pretty, pretty bad. Uh, I had a favorite pair of boots and I, when I fell in my very first race, so I DNF in the first race and, and when my ski came off, my my the toe piece of my boot broke off so um i had to i couldn't ski in my favorite boots so it like, kind of just set me back um and then i started skiing really well and then i crashed and right after the new year i crashed and uh cracked my tibia plateau um and had the worst bone bruise i probably could have had in my knee and uh took one day off and and iced my leg with with a nice machine. Those are amazing. Um, and was back out skiing the downhill two days later. So kind of just had to ski through pain the whole year. So, but I, yeah, I, I was able to get myself to a pretty good state actually by the time uh, nationals came around and was skiing well the second part of the year. So uh, kind of saved myself um, in order to get enough world cup points to keep my ranking uh, decent and uh, right, in, right around the top 30. And uh, so, yeah, I'm feeling good about, going into this year and uh, just switched companies too to Rossignol uh, this year. So I'm excited about that and just kind of switching things up after such a long time. It's just nice for me with, when I've been around for a while. So um, yeah, I'm excited for this season coming up for sure. When you're a speed skier, you need to have a certain uh, type of terrain in order to uh, practice your craft. And particularly in your case, when you're making the switch from head to Rossignol, what have you been able to do in preparation so far this year, this fall? Um, just, you know, we, th this year was really cool because we actually got to go back to Chile and train full length downhill. And, uh, we went to La Parva and it was a lot more gliding there. You're not really getting as, as many like hard turns, um, but got pretty like a, a good consistent hard uh, layer. And we're able to get that ripple that we want. We didn't change the gates for a couple of days, got the rock hard snow. Um, and then, so right when you start feeling good about yourself there, uh, we went home for a couple of weeks and then went back down to Portillo, which is like, I don't know if anyone knows that, if anyone's ever skied at Snowbird, um, that's just the one reference that I have is, uh, is uh, Regulator Johnson. One of the steepest groom trails there is pretty much what this downhill is like on the top part. So it's really in your face right away. And so is like, I'm feeling out new gear all summer and, and jumping on to these different courses. So it was cool to kind of feel out new gear on a, on a glidey course. And then, okay, I feel pretty good there. And then went to a steeper hill where it was bumpy and in your face and took, took a little bit of time just to get used to the timing of everything. But um, it was good. We like, I feel like, like our team got a really good balance this summer of, of steeps and flats. The last few years with, with COVID, we couldn't go down to Chile. 
and we had to go to Zermatt, which was our best option for sure in the world we could have done, but uh, we just didn't have the length or sometimes like our training would be 25 seconds long or 30 seconds long. So, um, but quality, but I think this year it was, it was great. We got a ton of mileage and uh, yeah, I just feel like I've, I've had a really good prep this year. So. Cool. You're going to get to cap it off at uh, Copper Mountain uh, with the U.S. Ski Team Downhill Training Center. Uh, when do you start training there, and what do you anticipate finding for conditions and getting you ready for those openers in Lake Louise and in Beaver Creek? Yeah, it looks good. Uh, I got a text from one of my teammates the other day. Uh, there's snow all the way down to the very bottom of the village, which is really great to see this time of year. Uh, sometimes it's, there's no snow at all and we're struggling and just to get it going. So that fires everyone up and I'm fired up that we can go there and ski and hopefully be full length, uh, really soon. Um, but yeah, heading there in a couple of days and going to do a little micro GS camp to work on some technique and get everything moving again. And then we're going to roll into, you know, in the gliding speed, um, training super G and downhill on the very top of the course, uh, probably go down into like, Oh, no ball, probably a few couple of days. And then, um, hopefully we'll be able to work our way down to down to the beginning of lights out and then all the way down to the finish. So, um, yeah, it's copper for us is so good to just kind of be that last block that just kind of says, okay, it's race time. But, um, it's kind of weird for us this year because, because we already kind of got ready to go race up over in Zermatt and it never happened. So we got I, mentally, I feel like I've already flipped the switch to start race mode. Um, but then I kind of had to like turn it down for another month. Uh, so I'm feeling tuned up and ready, but I think it'd be good. Now I can go into the, you know, this training block with more focus and, and that kind of racers edge a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to get there, get on that grippy hero snow. It's always nice. Cool. Let's wrap it up and talk about Beaver Creek. Birds of Prey, that's a favorite. If you're an American downhiller, that's where you want to perform. Tell us about the race coming up there in early December. Uh, it's one of my favorite courses of the year, for sure. It's very playful. Uh, it's got that hero snow. You could run 50th and it's smooth, pretty smooth. Um, it's uh, It's just it's hard to explain it's like like water skiing on glass sometimes i think it it's just so flowy and and we all really like it it's obviously cool to be home in front of our fans and uh get to and everything's in english we understand everything <laughs> uh and uh yeah it's good just to yeah just a race in colorado five, you know six hour drive away from my home is is unique for me and uh i love yeah i love skiing there Good. Well, we look forward to cheering you on and watching it on TV. Jared Goldberg, thank you so much for joining us here no tonight. Thanks for having me. Debut of Brass 101. Good luck yeah. this season. Bye, guys. That is Jared Goldberg. Great to have him uh, here joining us tonight. Uh, we've got a few more things to wrap it up, and I want to uh, uh, ask all of you to stick around. We're going to be showing Off Piste, which is a recreation of the accident in 2015, a very poignant uh, a reminder of uh, what we're all here for, to learn a little bit more so we can help to pre uh, prevent accidents. Uh, bear with me for just one second, and we will get back on track. I want to thank our sponsors again, World Cup Supply, U.S. Ski and Snowboard, uh, Backcountry Access, Know Before You Go, and Nordica. Really appreciate the support that they all provide. I uh, want to also remind you that we have two other Brass 101 presentations coming up this month. Uh, two weeks from uh, tomorrow, Thursday, November 17th, we'll be online with Ben Merkin. Uh, he is a three-year veteran of our Brass 101 programs and looking forward to having him back. And then welcoming a new instructor, a legendary ski patroller uh, who has worked sig a significant amount of time up in Alaska on big mountains, as well as her home in the Tahoe area. Lel Tone will be joining us on November 30th. And before we move on to off piste, I want to challenge each and every one of you who are on the uh, webinar here tonight, get your phones out right now and just uh, grab the QR code that's on the screen. 
we need your support. And whether you can give $1, $5, $50, or $100, uh, all of it goes to help the nonprofit work that Brass does. And it's all in the memory of Bryce and Ronnie. So just take a minute right now, get your phones out and take a snap of the QR code. That'll lead you to the donation page at brassavalanche.org. I want to also note for the uh, those folks who have left a Q&A after Dale left the call, we will get those answered offline for you. So you can expect an email from Dale in the next day or so with the answers to your question. And again, thanks, folks, for any donations you can make to Brass this evening. We want to wrap it up with a showing of off-piste. It was a tragic day on January 5th, 2015, that took the lives of Bryce and Ronnie. We remember them all the time. And in the last couple of weeks when U.S. ski team was over in Solden, passing the spot of the avalanche, it's always a really tough time as they head up to the glacier. So I invite you now to take the next 13 minutes, clear your mind a little bit, and just absorb off-piste tragedy in the Alps. Dispatch, possible two avalanche victims buried. I see something. Oh, oh, man. Man. Is this one of your friends? Yeah, that's Bryce. No pulse. Starting CPR. One, two, three, four, five, 15, six, 16, 17, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 2, 23, 24, 5, 6, 7, 8. Lift on three. One, two, three. Are you sure there were only two? Yeah, there's two. Just two. Of them. Just two. Okay, we're gonna find him. Ronnie! Not breathing, no pulse. Sorry, CPR. can turn deadly in a matter of seconds. It's hard to believe that such a tragedy could happen. The accident has left many in the skiing world in shock. Tragic news tonight as two elite skiers training for a spot on the U.S. Olympic team are killed in an avalanche. Rescue crews from Solden were on the scene immediately with multiple helicopters. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who are apparently lost in this uh, specific incident. I'm Bryce Astle. How does the gangster chains play into effect in your slalom skiing? Um, pretty aerodynamic. shattered and I know everyone around me was too and can't even possibly imagine what it was like for the families. Losing Bryce and Ronnie was a huge hit to the U.S. team. They're the next generation. These two guys were the best in their disciplines. Uh, Bryce in slalom, Ronnie in downhill and super G. They were the next up and comers. They could be the guys competing in the Olympics. This is the famous smile because uh, he had just won U.S. Nationals, juniors. He always had my back and it just, it makes you appreciate it more now that he's not here, you know? Bryce was such an important part of my life and after we lost him, it was a pretty easy decision for my wife and I to name our son Bryce. He lived for every moment. He would get done training and he would go out and he would ski. And this is a card that we made up at the time we lost the boys and it has Bryce so amazing on skis and Ronnie in his element going 70 miles an hour through the air. 
he was kind, and he was grounded. Ronnie, he was always just a jokester. He wasn't afraid of the, the World Cup vet. He would just always speak his mind to me, and I love that about him, you know? Watching him laughing just made me think, wow, I have the best brother ever. He was a good teammate, he was a good friend, a good son, and we had a lot of fun together. January 1st, 2015, I took Bryce to the airport. He was gonna hook up with uh, Ronnie Burlack and the rest of the US ski team. They were going to Europe to uh, train for uh, Europa Cup. We got to Solden and it had just snowed a lot. Obviously there's no training because there's so much snow. So we sent everyone out to go ski around and have some fun. Just seeing snow that's untouched and being like, this is a dream come true. We were having an amazing time. We could see the bottom of the valley, we could see the road, so we started skiing. I just remember skiing across this face and all of a sudden I just heard cracking. <laughs> Everything underneath me started moving. I saw Bryce, and I heard him say, oh shit. I never even saw Ronnie. We stood there, and we watched them go. Nothing made any sense. Then it just instinct took over, and there were people who had skied down right before us who saw everything and pulled out their transceivers. Are no they wearing beacons? No, no beacons. No, no, no avalanche equipment. I need shovels. I need shovels. That was when I realized how stupid we were being. Okay, does anybody have a probe? We're at the bottom of Solden One. We need a helicopter, two more patrollers, a hasty team, and an AED. Probably took 15 minutes for helicopters to come in. I was like pretty aware that it had been too long. The first thing that appeared was Bryce's boots sticking up out of the snow. He was upside down. His boot was six feet from the surface. Came across Ronnie a few minutes later. Ronnie, we got him. Did you get him out of the hole? That was an image that I'll never forget. The concept of riding up a lift, skiing on a trail, and we're in danger, that did not exist in any of our heads. The coaches and the boys did not receive any orientation or any training regarding the dangers of skiing in Europe versus skiing in North America. None of the young men in that group knew the difference between on and off piste. Off-piste in the United States is defined as out of bounds, going through the gate, going under the rope. That's not what the rules are in Europe. When you are off the groomer, you are off-piste. In Solden, the day before the avalanche that killed Bryce and Ronnie, there had been heavy snowfall and strong winds. What that did was, is it put a lot of weight on top of the snowpack, which was fragile. Once these skiers got onto that slope, it couldn't support the additional weight. That weak layer fractured over a wide area, and that slab came crashing down. It produced debris that weighed almost 7 million pounds, the same as almost 10 747s. It takes all of 20 minutes to, to learn and to be educated. You want to make sure you're prepared. There are five points that are always really good to remember. You want to get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. 
First, you need the gear. Going in the backcountry, you need a beacon, a probe, and a shovel. And unfortunately, that day in Solon, the boys did not have that. Ready? I would have done anything for rescue gear, especially a shovel. You can always increase your chances of being searchable if you're unlucky enough to be caught in an avalanche by having reco reflectors in your equipment and clothing. Getting the gear is useless if you don't know how to use it. You've got to get the training. Take an avalanche class. If we would have taken just one class, we would have known not to ski down that terrain in the first place. One key thing you're going to learn in every avalanche class is that you have to check the forecast every time you ride. None of us checked the forecast that morning. It would have taken just two minutes on the gondola ride, and none of this would have happened. So when you're out on the snow, you got to get the picture. And what does that mean? That means pay attention. Are you seeing recent avalanches? That's by far the most important clue. That's like Mother Nature screaming in your ear. If we had known it wasn't controlled, we 100% would not have been there. Finally, get out of harm's way. What that means is only one person is riding the slope at a time. We were breaking one of the simplest rules. In some ways, it's a miracle that all six of us didn't die. Once you get to the bottom, you need to get out of the way. That way, if somebody else in your group triggers an avalanche, you won't be caught. These five simple steps everyone should know about and everybody should be trained in. Coaches, parents, athletes, administrators of the program. Everything that we did could have easily been prevented. So I wish I could say that I couldn't have done anything to save their lives. That's just not true. Anytime you have a major accident like this, it causes a ton of introspective thought. We realized that we really needed to look at it from the top down, bottom up. How can we make sure everybody's more educated to avert and reduce the chance of anything like this ever happening again? That's why we at Brass are creating avalanche education specifically for coaches and athletes. We're also creating snow safety policies to be followed by ski racing groups. Ski racing is definitely a dangerous sport, but where we're going down is a really highly regulated area. You have all the fencing, you have the snow prep, you have all these things that are out there to keep you safe. You get out there in the backcountry, there's, there's none of those luxuries. For the people who assume that just because they know how to ski terrain or they know how to rip down a mountain because they ski downhill, it's, it's a very different beast. Don't let this happen to you and your family. Get educated, get out there, so we can keep skiing for Bryce and Ronnie, so their legacies live on. Folks, thank you so much for joining us tonight. As many times as I see that video, I still choke up and thinking about that day. Uh, as we close out, a big thanks again to our sponsors, World Cup Supplies, U.S. Ski and Snowboard, Backcountry Access, Know Before You Go, and Nordica. We appreciate all of your support. Again, if you haven't done so already, please grab your phone Check the QR code out that's on the screen right now. And any donation that you can make this evening to help Brass will help save lives in the future. Remember, we have more webinars coming up November 17th and again on November 30th. We hope you have a great season and most of all, a safe season. Thanks for joining us this evening.